Hello, everyone. My name is José Hugo Luz. I'm an interventional radiologist, uh, head chief of the interventional radiology department in Inca, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. I'm here with Dr. Alexandre Paladino, who is a medical oncologist, head chief of the um, oncology in Inca also, where I work. Also with me, my, my dear friend, uh, Hugo Pinto Marques, director of surgery of um, uh, the Lisbon Central University uh, Department. And also with me from the Netherlands, um, Dr. Martijn, who is the director of interventional radiology of the uh, medical um, Amsterdam Center. It's a pleasure to be with all of you. I'll, I'll, send, I'll pass the word to Dr. Martijn, who is, will show you us uh, a clinical case, please. Thank you, and thank you, Jose, for the for the invitation. So I brought this uh, clinical case on locally advanced pancreatic uh, carcinoma, um, and I would like to discuss with you what you believe, you know, would be the best option for this patient. So um, we are talking about a 56-year-old female patient with a, a good performance status. Uh, the ASO score is two. Uh, it was based on imaging locally advanced pancreatic carcinoma. Um, I do not have a video of the entire scan, but you can see the arrows, it's completely encasing, or at least for 270 degrees, the SMA was also uh, completely encasing the celiac axis, uh, and there was a teardrop deformation um, of the portal vein. This is the baseline information. Um, so before you, you can see here what we did, but if you have a patient like, like this, with this much encasement, no distant metastases, how would this patient be treated in your center? Uh, generally, we start with uh, systemic treatment, chemotherapy. Uh, we prefer to use fulfirinox. I think that's the most active uh, regime in this uh, situation. Uh, generally, we go to six, uh, up to eight cycle, cycles of treatment, generally. Okay, okay. yes. I think in our case, uh, I would say this is uh, um, an unresectable or marginal resectable question for now. Not now, anyway. So I would think that uh, this is a question for systemic therapy. Probably for very much with the regimen of choice in our case. I would discard in the future with a very good response the possibility of having a very aggressive surgery in order to resect this patient. It is very soon to say that. And I would like to know also the CI 19.9 values that we don't have, I think. No, I, it was not in the slides, but let's say uh, that it started, it was not above 200 uh, initially. So let's say it was 100 and now it decreased to 50, for example. Would you, would if it was really high, like 1000 up front, uh, what would that change? I don't think it would change. It's just another another information that it's good for us to have. Mm -hmm. It's a prognostic. But you're right. Important. Won't change anything. No, no, no. Okay, okay, let's go to the. I think it's pretty uh, routine to give fulfirinox, uh, and if a patient is not eligible for that, it's gem uh, side of an nap. Yeah, it's a routine. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so um, what in the Netherlands what we routinely do is uh, give four cycles, then have a CT scan, reassess uh, potential resectability. And if it's still unresectable uh, and there's no progression, we continue up to eight cycles. Um, and generally, you have some difficulty to go beyond eight cycles because of neuropathy. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we here uh, evaluate the, the case in four or four cycles and uh, decide to go uh, with chemotherapy or uh, chemotherapy or eventually a local treatment if the patient had a, uh, has a good has a good response. Okay. Yeah. It's the same. Thing. Yeah. I think this it makes sense. And, and and actually the scan you are looking at is the scan following eight cycles of fulfirinox. But now there's a new problem. Even though the um, CA 19.9 decreased and on the CT scan it was re resist stable, if I'm correct. Yeah, stable disease. We have new onset um, biliary tract obstruction and also a high grade stenosis. Um, it looks like an occlusion, but it was a high grade uh, stenosis uh, in 3D of the portal vein. So, first question is, I, I guess, for the surgeon, would you consider this uh, a sign of disease progression or can it be fibrotic retraction? How would you see this if the, um, the tumor marker is decreasing, you do not see any growth of the tumor on the CT, 
but you do suddenly have uh, a biliary tract obstruction and a portal vein that is now stenosed. I couldn't rule out the response of chemotherapy. This could be a progression, but this can also be a response. Perhaps, for example, if we have a, a previous PET CT scan, this would maybe help if we compare the first one with this one, but we don't. So if the tumor markers are decreasing, I wouldn't say this is progression. I would consider probably a fibrotic response to chemotherapy and probably think about uh, studying the portal. No, this is another, this is another degree of, uh, of acting. But for now, I would say I would consider this progression. Okay, good that you say that. I, I think that uh, we can use the the tumor marker in this case. It's very helpful, uh, very uh, useful because. Uh, it's not, uh, it's common to uh, see a stable disease in pancreatic cancer with a response because of uh, this mobilized reaction in the tumor, tumor uh, and maybe it could be a, a retraction uh, because, a, uh, because a response. So happy that you say that. You say you, you agree as well? Yes, absolutely. So we agreed, and actually this, this patient was one of the trial patients, uh, the, the crossfire trial patients, I should say. So we decided to move forward, uh, but obviously first uh, drain the biliary tract obstruction. Let me go forward here. And the, the patient was uh, randomized to irreversible electroporation. So I'll show you the case later, but should we have uh, still said yes to the IRE with the portal vein stenosis? That's it, that's the question I wanted to ask you. This patient risks having a portal vein thrombosis, and this is going to jeopardize the whole treatment. So probably I would think about putting a stent in the portal vein before proceeding to this, because I think there's a reasonable risk. Don't give it all away, but um, it, obviously <laughs> the discussion here is, um, I think it's actually, in, 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 there's some reports in literature, a high-grade stenosis of the portal. I mean, if it's occluded already, well, you cannot, you know, uh, occlude. And, and somehow there's collaterals and uh, apparently there's sufficiently flow, sufficient flow going to the liver. But if there's a high grade stenosis, there's a good chance you will acutely uh, thrombose or occlu uh, occlude it with your IRE. So this is what we did. Uh, you can see that uh, it was a large tumor still. Yeah. Uh, so we well, had to how, use seven years. How large was it? How large was it? Do you remember that? I don't think it says it here, but you can, uh, based on the measurements, it was close to that. So that's a good good point of discussion. In in the trials, um, we went for an upper limit of five centimeters. Uh, honestly, I think if I would redesign it now, I think four centimeters uh, is actually the max. Uh, so because you can see here um, where these needles have to be placed, and this takes a lot of time. I mean, that's not a big problem, but it increases the risk for every needle to, to traverse one of these arteries. And uh, you know, the larger the tumor, the less chance you have of completely eradicating the cancer. So what do you think? Is it, what's, what's your upper limit? My upper limit would be even less. Uh, for me, who I don't have as much experience as you do. I, I like not, not uh, going beyond three because um, I'm still building my, building my practice and then too many needles uh, increase my risk. And, yeah, um, and one thing that I, I'm really worried when I have those cases with uh, stents is uh, getting too close to the stent. Mm -hmm. how, how worried are you about that? You know? Well, we're now talking about uh, the biliary tract stent. Uh, yes. Yeah. So um, not too worried anymore. Okay. So this was an absolute contraindication when we started. Then it became a relative contraindication uh, according to this consensus document that we have. Nowadays, I would actually favor, so in the old days, we placed either uh, a plastic stand via, uh, with a gastroenterologist or via PTCD, just to make sure there's no metal in the way. Now, I think I would prefer to have a self-expandable metal stand in there. Um, and, and the reason for that, it is the occlusion or the, the injury of the biliary tract. We'll get to that, uh, but um, I would not, I, do think uh, there's been so many reports of a safe procedure with a metal stent in the central bile ducts that I would, uh, in most cases, favor a metal stent. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you can actually get yeah. very close to it. Well, well don't touch it. Okay. Uh, then the machine will give an over, you know, mm -hmm. current. Yes. So the con connectivity. So yes. I have a question on that. Yeah. If you have a plastic stent, the chances are that the lesion in the plastic stent will be so, so big. But with a metallic stem, there is also heat transmission through the wire. 
so all the uh, metal component of the stems. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, the 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 the, the heat formation um, that is there's no heat formation of the stand. So if you touch the stand, the stand is a prolongation of the needle. And uh, we actually did some thermometry maps and the, the stand, because it didn't make sense, according to uh, people that know way better than me, that it didn't make sense physically that it would heat up. And it does not heat up if it's, uh, let's say, three uh, or more millimeters away from the stand. So uh, it changes the electrical field. So you may have occurrences, you may have... Uh, and uh, I mean, um, the safest thing is if there's no stand or no plastic stand or no biliary tract obstruction. But I would feel comfortable. Uh, I think the majority of cases in the Crossfire trial and in the Penfire 2 trial is actually with a self-expandable metal stand. For the sake of time, uh, because you already gave it, gave it away a little bit. Um, so you can guess what happened here. Um, we, uh, the, the patient uh, experienced uh, shortly after the procedure uh, a severe ascites. Uh, and you could see on the CT scan uh, a severe worsening. It was a near occlusion of the uh, portal vein. So what to do now? So in those days, we did not place the portal vein stent prior to the procedure. So now there's a, an acute, let's say, high-grade stenosis slash occlusion. I would call Jose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got to open it. Yeah. yeah. You have to try it. Yeah, you have to try it. Otherwise, do you think it's acceptable to, to use a transhepatic root or use like a transplant? Well, that's a, that's a good one. I would go for the liver first. Um, we, we, we have used the spleen a, a lot, actually. When, um, when we have uh, the situation with the left hyperportal uh, tension ex only, we usually go f from the spleen to, uh, to embolize the shunts. Uh, but I would go first with, from the liver. And actually, you can use both axes. If you're, if you're going for the liver and you cannot go through, you can go with the two axes, which makes it uh, uh, sometimes uh, viable to do the procedure. Uh, so go for first liver and then liver and spleen. I will do this because I was, I was saying this because many times, as you, as you know, we have a lot of experience in perihelial conjugacy. You have more than 100 patients that were resected in the portal vein. Some of those patients get the stenosis, at least in the middle term, and some of them are treated with stamps, and they have pretty good quality and of life and pretty good results. So, sure, sure, sure. sure. Uh, is it free, uh, uh, it's common uh, to have a, a thromb thrombosis uh, in the stand um, after the procedure. After the procedure, yeah. you can't you can't have I a have thrombosis as yeah, you do. Yes, ideally you have to use it. Sure Once you that. put a stand in, you should you should. That's a, that that can be a problem, but uh, right. you should. Yeah, yeah, maybe to add to that, if you have placed, if we would have placed the stand prior to the procedure, have done the procedure. Uh, this patient would need, uh, I guess, lifelong, in my opinion, um, sure, uh, sure, you know, sure. anti-coagulation. This is an interesting discussion yeah. because we actually don't know. No, we don't know. But what what is, do you what think? What is the correct time? Yeah. I would say to be safe, I would use it lifelong. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. I'm not sure if six months is not enough. No, no, no. Yeah. We're, it's good that you mentioned this for, let's say, not this specific patient, but portal vein, uh, high-grade stenosis with ascites, etc. There's no large scale evidence on, on, on whether it makes sense to place a stand or just wait for the collaterals. I also have a feeling that we can really help these patients, but uh, we need to work on evidence. But, but, but on that, uh, very quickly, I yes. think we cannot wait for the collaterals because we are not sure. Collaterals develop. Me, for example, that have extensive experience mm -hmm. in liver transportation. Collaterals develop in a pretty long time. They need time to develop. I don't think in the oncology setting, same thing. So you will have an acute occlusion mm -hmm. with ascites and no time to develop collaterals. So I would definitely yeah, yeah. go for a stance. Yeah. yeah. So I think yeah. I fully agree. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think you went through it. Well, <laughs> you see the images already. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what we would do, uh, just a quick question. So I would, if there's this much ascites, uh, I would drain the ascites first. Because otherwise, it's, oh, yeah. well, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And then we went for the transhepatic uh, route, okay. uh, as you can see here. And then, um, well, maybe up for discussion here, we placed, uh, uh, it's a sinus stand. I don't know if that's available here in Brazil. Yeah, it is. Okay, so it's a, um, it's a self-expandable stand, but there's not many uh, fenders that sell large size stands. So this is the one that we normally use for stenosis, for example, for pancreatitis, et cetera, and for this uh, indication as well. Yeah, pretty high grade. Yeah, yeah. You can see the... How large was the stand? Stenosis. 
Ooh, Ooh does it say here? Uh, I think 18 millimeters, something like that. Yeah. Because uh, one other thing to avoid uh, instant occlusion is the size of the stent. It has to be not too small, otherwise it will, uh, there's more risk of it occluding, in my opinion. Um, but the sinus stent, as you know, it's an uncovered stent. Yes. So let me go forward. I mean, it was a stenosis, so there was no rationale to make it a covered stent. But I'll show you what happened. So three week, weeks here after, the patient came back um, with fever, positive blood culture, and you can see it's difficult. You have to see all the images by itself, but something is wrong here. So now there's a stent in the biliary tract and a stent in the, you can see that down below on the right, stent in the uh, portal vein, but there somehow is air, an air bubble in the, in the uncovered stent, so in the middle of the, uh, of the uh, uh, portal vein. And you can also see a lot of air going up into the liver, into the portal branches. And if you look more closely, there's actually the air, there's a sort of a fistula coming from the biliary tract stent, also uncovered, up for discussion. Mm -hmm. So now there's a fistula, that's the only one we have ever seen, up for discussion, but from the biliary tract, through the ablation zone, to the oral vein. Oh, through the ablation zone? Okay. Through the, yeah. 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 Um, so, so what to do with this? this? Yeah, that's not good at all. <laughs> I so so we have to have a fistula between the portal vein yes. and the biliary tract. Yeah, I yes. said it the other way around, but yes. But it it did, it somehow it did not bleed. And you don't know if it's because of erosion or, is, or if it's because of the treatment. Probably because of erosion, because the treatment was before the portal stents. So I think you need a covered stent either in both or at least in the bile duct. Well, that's uh, yeah. 10 points before you go. Uh, at least that's what we did as well. Yeah. I wouldn't know of any other way how to, I mean, so surgi surgically. It's, the, common. Uh, yeah, it's very common. want to go there surgically what? because very we don't have any, yeah. any, any tissue, I would say. You have to have some room in the tissue to resect mm -hmm. and, and, to, and to reconstruct again. And with this type of tumor, you won't have any. So it's definitely... I had a discussion yeah. with, uh, with, with our surgeons, should we uh, place a covered stent in the, uh, in, well, in the portal vein, yes. So that's what, that's what, he, say, what he mentioned, but uh, in the biliary tract. So it was close off both. Um, I don't know if that's necessary. I think it's, there's a fistula anyway, it's infected. I, don't know. I mean, it's also a route out, you know, via the biliary tract for that fistula. So we placed, let me go here. Um, so we repunctured transhepatically the portal vein and uh, we placed a covered stent. In this case, it was a balloon expandable atrium stent. I don't know if that one is available, but that, I think that's one of the largest um, uh, ones. You can inflate to, to 12 millimeters, but then you can use larger balloons to reinflate and a little bit bigger. Uh, and well, you can see here actually the original stent, mm -hmm. and, uh, the, uh, the covered stent is shorter, the covered part. And obviously start for, uh, with uh, amoxicillin. I don't know why it says seven days. I think routine would now actually be way longer, but uh, antibiotics and, uh, and uh, um, covered stand in the oral vein stand. So you left the- That's uh, really the interesting case. Huh? Very interesting. It is interesting. Yeah, this was a uh, scary complication, but uh, yeah, a lot- So you left the, uh, the, 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 the non-covered stand in the, in the uh, biliary tract. You didn't put a covered stand there? No. Okay. No. It, it, up for discussion. Yeah. Uh, the, the rationale was that you only have one image here, but if you had the entire scan, there was a lot of air in the ablation zone. And if you would seal it off, it would become an abscess. There were, we were a little bit scared of that. And if you do not seal it off, it there's a, there's a way back and forth for the fistula to form and to, to become chronic. Interesting. I would be afraid not to put a coverage stand in the, the biliary tree. <laughs> we had a lot of discussion. I, I yeah, guess there's, there's many, not uh, right in the answer. Yeah. Yes, uh, and what about local control of the tumor after IRE? So this patient uh, actually did okay. She was quite ill for the first uh, months. She survived up to 15 months, uh, say somewhere. So, so she did, was sort of average in the trial. Uh, she, the, the tumor did progress eventually, uh, which is not too bad for a large size tumor uh, like this. Mm -hmm. I think this is very important because this is real life. Yes. We are always talking about the ideal cases and we don't discuss this type of cases that happen. That's totally real life, yeah. Okay, okay so sorry, then I will just explain <laughs> to you what we would do nowadays, but you, you gave it away. So if a patient is eligible at all, but let's say um, that a patient is in a study or a research project or radiotherapy is not an option, 
and IRE is the only option, and there's a portal fame narrowing, we would, um, what we would do is uh, transhepatically place a catheter, then go to the CT suite for the percutaneous IRE in the same day, and then uh, directly after the procedure, place that stent so that the stent is not in the middle of the ablation zone. And um, so, so that, that's, that's our routine. And after this case, it was actually based on this case. We've now done that in uh, well, approximately 10, 10, 11 cases. Uh, and at least we managed to keep the, um, the, the, the portal vein open for up to three months in, in uh, I think, all but one of these cases. So this is some, I think I mentioned that during the conference as well. It's one of these ways to avoid uh, complications by you know, either not treating, which is also fine. I mean, these, these are complex cases. And if IRE is the only option and, and the patient is willing to take the risk, portal vein stand, peer procedure. What do you think? So you, you, you have the left the guide wire in place, you do the ablation, then you place the stand. Yeah, yeah. Okay. the guide wire. So you don't have the stand in the place. middle of the way while you're doing the, uh, the, the ablation. Well, I, I guess, guess the same goes as with the biliary tract. So you could do that, but then it's the portal vein that is narrowed. So that's the tumor is completely encasing. So if there's a large stand that's already large size, how to get these needles in and not perforate. Yes. So yes. That, that would be more difficult. So yeah. I would favor placing a catheter. Or a wire, or a wire. Do yeah. the procedure and directly after. And the other question is, uh, should we upfront put, put uh, a cover stand uh, in the oh. way? Yeah. Uh, so so far we only use the sinus stand. Okay. So the yeah. I would not. I would not put a cover stand up front. No, it's, but it's, there's only a case yeah. where yeah. Yeah, yeah. probably would have been uh, you know yeah. beneficial. Nice, that. excellent case. This is excellent. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we're over time. Yes. Okay. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure Thank to you. be here with you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thanks, everyone.